Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to see you all here today. Uh, my name is Joan Courage, and I am the curator of the Mass Observation Archive, which is held here at Peace, part of the University of Sussex's Special Collections. Um, my colleague, Kirsty Patrick, who was supposed to be doing the talk with me today, unfortunately couldn't be here, so I'm hugely grateful to another colleague, Jessica Scantlebury, <laughs> who has stepped in at the very last minute and agreed to, to, to talk with me. So, get the double act today. Um, but what we thought we would do is we're going to tell you just a, a bit about the history of mass observation and the work that mass observation does today. And we're going to do it very linearly, so we're going to start at the beginning. But um, we thought we might start off with just telling you 10 things that mass observation has told us that we wouldn't have known if mass observation hadn't existed, or we might have known but not necessarily had recorded. This is actually something that featured in BBC magazine. Um, in November. Was it November? Yeah, was it really? November. Blimey. Anyway. So, the first thing was, did you know that real coffee, as in cafetiere coffee, started to make an appearance during the Christmas of 1986? Mm -hmm. Remember what you used to drink before that? <laughs> it was in a jar, wasn't it? <laughs> um, during the 1930s, mass observation um, spent a lot of time recording activity in pubs. And one of their findings was that in uh, 1937, in a pub in Brighton, um, it took around three, uh, seven minutes and three seconds for someone to drink a pint. Um, it's quite fast, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the slowest um, <coughs> time recorded was on Tuesday evenings, while the fastest time recorded, obviously, Friday night. <laughs> you wonder after at what point in the evening they stopped recording <laughs> and carried on drinking. Some very blurry uh, notes <laughs> that we've got in our collections. Uh, but still on the theme of, of food and drink, um, custard powder. It was noted in the modern project that in the 1980s, in Christmas diaries that were kept during the 1980s, custard powder was being abandoned because people decided to make their own custard. Hmm. Um, in 1980s again, uh, Bob Gildoff was, for the mass observers, one of the most important figures of, of the 80s. But despite being that important, no one could spell his name. They were always writing Gildorf or Gildeff. <laughs> Never Gildorf. I'm not sure I could get it right either after all these years. Um, Winston Churchill, rewinding back to it, he wasn't everybody's favourite speaker. Um, within the archive, we can see the attitudes towards public figures changes over time. And um, listening to what's now considered one of Churchill's greatest wartime speeches that we would probably all recognise, uh, one observer back in the, the 30s, 40s, noted, uh, his aunt noted that he's no speaker, is he? He won't get anywhere. <laughs> Marriage. What makes a happy one? Well, this is something that's preoccupied again, mass observation. And in 1943, um, they asked the, the uh, mass observation diarist. Um, 61% thought it was just liking your partner, while only 23% thought you actually had to love your partner. And a further 4% thought it was down to education and intelligence. 1938, Mass Observation investigated the popularity of the Lambeth Walk dance. Do you remember the music? Lambeth Walk? Oi. We're not going to do it. <laughs> she wouldn't let me. <laughs> But it wasn't just in Lambeth that they were doing it. It was being done in Mayfair ballrooms, suburb suburban dance halls, Cockney parties, whatever a Cockney party may be, and why that's different, and village hops as well. Um, in fact, one observer who visited the Isle of Arran noted that it was really popular there as well. Um, again, back to Christmas. In the 1980s, mass observation found out that most people at their dinner in between 1 and 2 o'clock, and most people went, went to bed after midnight. Um, and during the war, pets was a, a subject that was investigated by mass observation, what happened to pets. And uh, they collected a leaflet, which we hold here, which was guidance on how to treat animals for both hysteria and shock during the blitz. Um, and also a wonderful story that my colleagues who work in the education um, project discovered about um, a little story about a pet rabbit called Skippy, who went missing. A little girl was absolutely devastated. A pet rabbit went missing until years later. Her mother fessed up that she'd eaten. <laughs> Back to the war again. Um, we've got lots of stories about evacuation, including one report from a father who wanted his son brought back from being evacuated because he thought that he was being taught fancy manners and therefore wouldn't um, be the same after he returned. <coughs> so never mind being safe. 
worry about your manners. <laughs> <laughs> manners mean everything. So how is all of this information gathered? Well, um, the history of mass observation is, is very much embedded in this concept of recording everyday life, about what ordinary life in Britain was. And it was founded originally in 1937, so we've now been going for 77 years. 77 years? Yeah, yeah. 77 years. No, longer than that, isn't it? Yeah, no, 77 <laughs> years um, recording everyday life in Britain. But how did it start? Well, um, thinking back to 1937, the big events that were in the run-up to that particular period were uh, obviously the ab abdication crisis, the abdication of Edward VIII, um, and also events such as the burning of the Crystal Palace, the destruction of the Crystal Palace. And throughout events such as this, um, one of the, the founders of mass observation, who I'll talk about in a moment, the founders of mass observation realised that within all of the reporting of these stories, there were no voices of ordinary people. They were official voices. They were voices of government representatives or the royal family or prime ministers or the church. But ordinary people's opinions weren't being voiced in the public media. So mass observation was essentially founded to measure the gulf between what was portrayed as public opinion in the, pub in, in the, in the popular media against what actual public opinion was. And the three people who were credited with founding mass observation came from very different backgrounds in order to do this. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever come across the films of Humphrey Jennings documentary filmmaker. He worked for the, uh, the Crown unit, the, the film unit, during the war, making sort of, I suppose, propaganda films, you might want to describe them as. But actually, the interesting thing about the work that Jennings was doing was it was very much embedded in documentary making. He had ordinary people acting their lives rather than bringing in Hollywood stars to act lives. So documentary, really important in the foundation of mass observation. The other two founders, who were perhaps more active ultimately than Jennings, because Jennings only stayed with the organisation for a year or so, were Tom Harrison and Charles Madge. Harrison was um, an adventurer, an explorer, an ornithologist, and an anthropologist, amongst many other things. He was a true polymath, a very single minded man who was very driven by his ambitions and wouldn't be sort of moved from, from the direction of his ambition. But he brought elements of all of those experiences. So ornithology, which he, um, as, a, as a young man, whilst at Harrow, actually instigated the largest scale British um, study of birds that had been done up to that date. So it was about watching and observing and noting down behaviour. Um, and of course, as an anthropologist, he had, uh, he had sort of undertaken lots of studies in which he had gone travelled around the world and lived with different cultures and actually lived as part of those cultures to understand how the people within those, those civilizations, as he called them, savage, savage civilizations, how they lived. The final um, of the three founders was Charles Madge, who was a poet. So quite a different background to uh, Tom Harrison, the adventurer. He was a poet. He was married at that point to Kathleen Rain, the poetess. He was also a journalist and he worked for the Daily Mirror, who was a member of the Communist Party as well. So there we have this kind of combination of um, journalism and poetry, and actually he was very interested in surrealism as well, so imagery and, and that sort of thing. So this was the background to which mass observation was, uh, was founded. And when they got together, they decided that what they wanted to do was not set out in quest of the truth or facts for their own sake or for the sake of an intellectual minority, but to expose them in simple terms to all observers so that their environment may be understood and must constantly transform. So in other words, use the people to observe themselves, show them those observations, and then they will be able to use them to make their lives better, to transform them. Whether that actually worked or not, I don't know, but what it did do was provide an amazing Mind, uh, database that has been mined for many, many years now on what ordinary life in Britain was like at that point. So one of the very first projects that Mass Observation undertook was based in Bolton and Blackpool. Um, started in 1937 and continued through into 1938. Mass Observation had um, a headquarters in, Black in Bolton and a headquarters in London, but I'm just going to concentrate on Bolton for now. Um, and what they did was, uh, probably the best way of describing it is a, a bunch of white middle class men 
um, from the southeast, uh, went into camp to Bolton, hired a house there, and watched how, and I described what they described as the natives, how the natives of Bolton lived. And they did this in all sorts of ways, um, one of which was to issue things like competitions about what is happiness, and this is one of the first competitions that they, they sort of put out there. And in order to understand what made people in Bolton happy, rather than going out and asking them, they decided to issue competitions like this. Um, they also, and this is one of the, unfortunately wasn't carried through to the rest of their studies, but they also uh, created a photo and painting project. And we have a series of about 300 photographs of Bolton and Blackpool life taken by Humphrey Spender, who was a photographer for the Picture Post, um, which just concentrate on Bolton and Blackpool. And these are just three examples of them, which I'm using to highlight the kinds of things that mass observation was interested in studying. So work was something they were very interested in, people's working lives. They were particularly interested in women as well, this idea that um, there weren't that many voices out there to record what ordinary women felt, experienced and believed in. Um, again, being, so it's a bit hazy, that film, but being um, in Bolton, they were very interested in industry. So a lot of studies were done in which they went in and, and spoke to and observed factory workers in the <coughs> industry and weaving, um, both at work, <coughs> but also at play and we're back to pubs. An awful lot of mass observations seem to centre around pubs, actually. Um, but this is quite a famous picture taken <coughs> by Spender because of the fact that um, there's a gentleman here holding his hand up. And for many years, we thought, oh, it's because he didn't, he realised that Spender was taking a photograph of him and he didn't want to have it taken. So, he hung. And so my husband looked at it a few months ago and said, oh, sure, he's just waving at the bloke in front of him. So you know, it shows how you can <laughs> interpret pictures in different ways. But so these are the sorts of things that the mass observers of this panel of investigators uh, went out into Bolton and observed and recorded and participated in life in Bolton. Um, and this continued on throughout the country. So they started to expand outside of Bolton and um, a team of investigators were employed to observe life in all sorts of areas within Britain, largely in towns, but sometimes in rural areas. And they were sent out with objectives of uh, looking at different themes in life. So this particular observer was sent out to find out about leisure in London. And he chose to go and look into dancing and dance halls. So what we have are two or three archive boxes balls of material like this relating to dance halls and leisure entertainments in London um, between about 1938 and 1942. And this is a really good example of the kind of work that they did, uh, observational work, um, in which we have here, and there's a little story that goes behind this, this particular observer was sent into the dance halls with a, a partner to two men, and the partner was very good at dancing. So he found himself a few pretty girls, went off and did lots of dancing for the evening, that was what he did. Um, this chap couldn't dance, and therefore ended up having to do all of the work and sat there watching what was going on and noting it down. So he noted down the dresses that the women were wearing, uh, he listened to the conversations that were going on around him and he wrote those down. He asked people who were there, why did you come here? What is it about this place that you like? What do you, don't you like? Um, he spoke to the band, asked about the music that was requested, the kind of music that they were playing. He spoke to the managers and again asked about, you know, sort of the clientele and are you, who do you market to and that kind of thing. And then he actually watched the dancing, and this is a, a wonderful example of how mass observation tried to be very scientific about the work they did. And he wanted to examine where men held their partners on their backs. So he devised this counting system that he would be able to say, well, at this particular dance, sort of 15 men were holding at position eight and six at position five, and a couple were brave enough to sit below the waist down to position nine. Um, it's quite strange to think, well, why on earth would you want to know that today, other than the fact it's quite fun to, to sort of to read these things and to be transported back. But actually, a lot of the people that use us can be sociologists or historians who are interested in things like developing attitudes or changes in intimacy between the sexes. Perfect way of trying to sort of find out, well, how do people dance back in 1938? And how do they dance today? How might that have changed? 
Likewise with the drinking, the um, example that Jessica gave about how quickly people drink pints, a really good way of sort of positioning where um, drinking habits were a few decades ago. They also collected lots of ephemera. So we have things here like the sort of a Locarno School of Dancing uh, program and uh, tickets, all sorts of things that otherwise would get thrown away, but mass observation collected them. They also studied other aspects of people's lives. So not just work and leisure, but how people lived. Um, and this is an example from work that was done by the investigating panel on housing. It's actually a project that was done with an architectural school to, um, to survey a street in Fulham, Strode Road. But they basically went out, they observed everything that was happening in that street. So there would be a poor student who would be stationed at the corner of the street and would write down how many people passed him throughout the day, how many cars, <coughs> how often the postman went past whilst other students would go through the street and uh, knock on people's doors and ask them sort of very typical survey questions that many of us have probably been asked before uh, by Gallup pollsters or what have you. Know, do you. Are you happy living here? Um, what are the benefits to living in this road or this particular area? Do you rent your house or have you purchased it? And then others went in and actually made much more detailed uh, studies of the homes we have here a first floor plan <coughs> of a, a house. I'm not sure which number house it was, but a house on Strode Road in Fulham. Um, other bits of, of material from this particular folder also detail the patterns of the wallpaper, the kind <coughs> of furniture that are in there. So we have this snapshot of a home, a series of homes um, from August 1938, sitting in a box waiting to be opened and revealed. It's a really magical experience. I mean, I'm sure that's why you're all here, because archive the magical. There's something really magical about opening up and suddenly seeing all paper pieces in there and thinking, oh, God, it's actually a pattern from somebody's house. Um, this is what they chose, this is the reason they chose it, or whatever you might think of it. And this is um, just an example, as I was saying earlier, about the events that are happening on the road. So the, the observation, they did surveys, but they also observed. And um, this is... Um, 8 a.m. on the 25th of August 1938, uh, brewer's handcart outside public house, number three, unattended, green grocer's car cart outside number 57, unattended, woman brushing and banging doormat at outside house, and so it goes on very, very detailed observations of what's happening in there. Um, this is the kind of stuff that sometimes we get um, TV film media, they'll come and use and they'll recreate, they'll use these to recreate events. And I don't know if any of you remember a few years ago there was a, a Channel 4 programme called The 1940s House, which sort of tried to set up a home, 1940s style, and, and, and people lived in it for a few weeks. Well, they used a lot of mass observation to create that, to sort of get the inspiration, largely actually one of the diaries, which I'll talk about in a bit, to create the father's role in it as well. But um, over 80 different subjects were asked about by mass observation. So we've touched on, on leisure, on housing, reading, uh, what else was there? Sex, drinking, gambling, um, blind people, dogs in wartime, bird nesting, all sorts of, some very obvious things like political situation, general elections, and, and, and to other things, so very general things, to other things that are much more intimate, like personal appearance and relationships. They also did a lot of work on food, which is probably not surprising, because mass observation started in 1937, and was very active throughout the Second World War, and um, in the, the immediate years after, the, the years of austerity, and of course food became quite a national obsession with rationing. So we have some wonderful examples of uh, how things like cafe culture and restaurants were affected by rationing in the boxes of which we've got some examples here relating to food. Um, the examples I'm about to show you come from a, a, a box on cafes and a young lady was sent into London to examine cafe culture. She was about 16 or 17 at the time, so she was very young. She was also very resourceful, so the first thing she did was to sign up to become a nippy or a waitress at Lyons Corner House, and she went through all of the training, 
and she noted down everything that she did in training, what the trainers were like, what the atmosphere was like, um, what kind of activities she had to do. And then she started to write about the people she was training with and the things they said and about their lives as well. So you get this whole picture of what it was like to be a nippy, the Lions Corner House in Lord Arch. Um, but then she also sort of in her time off went to various other cafes, she wandered around the East End and we have a whole series of reports and observations of her going to different cafes and just writing down what it smelt like, what it looked like, what the food was like. Um, all sorts of things. So again, it's kind of snapshots of life that would otherwise be lost. One of my favourite ones is a, a very detailed description she makes of a rather grimy sounding cafe in Stepney which has a fly papers hanging from the wall and this description of how the flies are just kind of slowly dying. <laughs> Not eating there. But of course, the wall was very, very, um, was very important in mass observations story because I think in many ways if it hadn't been for the Second World War mass observation may not have been so successful at what it had done because for many reasons mass observation gave people a way of expressing how they felt in that time of conflict and also it was able to capture um, little things little kind of points in life that otherwise might have disappeared so things like fire watching um, and the responses to air raids and air raid shelters and what have you. And here are some examples from the fire watching, um, the, air, sorry, the air raids collection that we have, in which they went round and uh, interviewed fire wardens. They collected the various ephemera that was around. I'm hoping they took this down after the meeting so that people actually turned up to the meeting as well. But, um, and they asked people about what it was like in that period. And this is an extract from a, um, a, an account which is actually written by a diarist uh, called Olivia Cockett, but she, was, she decided she was going to go and talk to an air raid warden and find out more about what it was like for him. And Jessica has an extract for us about that. Once a man was blown into the road from 40 feet up a block of flats, Len and his pal went to pick him up. Len said, don't look, his legs had gone. His pal said, Lord, I can't touch him. And the man said, you biffed. I lost that one during the last war. It's my wooden leg I've lost now. <laughs> and then she goes on to describe another time when Len helps to rescue a man and his wife from a bombed house. And suddenly Len remembers that he had, they had a baby. So after an hour of searching, they hear the two-year-old cry out for help from his dad. When they found, found him, Len described him as a bit of pulp in my hand. I went to crackers. The child died a couple of hours later. From the first time I read that, I found that piece when I was writing a, a talk to do in London, on London Observed, and I was in the reading room and I started crying. <laughs> At this awful moment, for myself, all the people I work with are going to see me crying and they're going to worry about the, the papers getting wet. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> It just, you know, again, it's just the, the strength of feeling. And that one of the things that mass observation was able to do is obviously <coughs> Churchill didn't like mass observation because he saw it as undermining morale. And the way that I view that is because it was trying to tell the true stories that were going on rather than the stories of everybody being very strong and sort of pulling together during this time of conflict and hardship. What mass observation was allowing many people to do was to put into writing almost anonymously so that they could be more open about it, how they really felt about being in this sort of situation. And we have some examples here from the other way that mass observation collected data in that as well as having a paid panel of investigators, they recruited volunteers from all around the country to respond to questionnaires and to write diaries about their lives. So these are people like you and me just from all over the place, all over the, the UK just writing about their daily lives and how they felt. And I think often the, the sorts of things that were put down in those writings were things that people may not have said to anybody else. So whilst Britain's trying to put on this kind of you know, dip spirit, stiff up a lip, we're going to be okay, the diaries that, are, that, that mass observation collected actually record a very different story, such as that, that story that you read there. These diaries, um, 
a very clear picture, I apologise for that. These diaries are actually the diaries of Nella Last, who's probably our most famous diarist. And I don't know if any of you have come across but, uh, Virginia Woolf, Victoria, <laughs> Victoria Woods. Um, television play Housewife 49. Um, Housewife 49 was actually Nella Last and she wasn't Housewife 49 at all, she was a housewife who was 49. So the 49 actually referred to her age when she started writing from that observation. But she wrote from that format observation from 1939 through to the mid-1960s and recorded all sorts of different aspects of life. Um, she was one of over 400 other writers who wrote diaries for mass observation, who themselves were one of over 2,000 individuals who contributed to mass observation by answering questionnaires, doing observations, or sending in diaries. So she was only one. But I would like to just um, ask Jessica to do one more brief extract from her writing, which is rather beautiful. We sat on the slope of a head and watched the surface. I saw a group sitting near in very earnest conversation. Their heads were together. I'd love to go over and butt in. I love an argument. And I thought, perhaps they're talking about the atomic bomb or the results of the general election. I had very good hearing. And when I got used to the different sounds, I could hear what they were discussing. It was the new cold perm. Every woman I know is interested in it. It's another revolution for us. <laughs> so Nella's work was amongst, uh, it, it lies amongst over 3,000 boxes of the rest of Mass Observation. It's an absolutely huge collection. Um, and what do they do with all of this data? Well, they didn't purely kind of keep it there for us to be able to talk about 75 years later or for, for academics and media and, and students to use. Um, what they wanted to do, as I referred in one of my first slides, was to actually crunch it all up and put it back out there. Um, so that people will be able to read it. And this is what they did. They published these books. They published over 25 books in, in the lifespan of mass observation. They then um, they did radio broadcasts, all sorts of things like that. But mass observation itself, the original uh, organisation, sort of went into abeyance around the mid-1950s. It became a market research company um, and stopped the sort of social research aspect uh, of its work. And then in 1970, the original archive of mass observation was brought to the University of Sussex on the invitation of Lord Asa Briggs, who at that point was the vice chancellor and social historian, so who's very interested in what could be done with that archive in terms of creating it as a public access archive, both for academic use, but also for general public use. And that's where it's been ever since. But I'm going to pass on to Jessica, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what's happened since then. Okay, so as Fiona says, I'm going to turn our attention now to the <coughs> Observation Project, which was relaunched in 1981, with the view to revive this kind of idea of the national parallel of writers, which Mass Observation had in the 1930s. Um, like in 1937, the thing that launched the project was a royal event, the um, wedding of um, Prince Charles and Princess Diana, I nearly said Camilla then. <laughs> And since then, we've um, asked around um, 300 different directives sent to all our observers all over the UK, and we've asked directives on a range of themes, things like the national lottery, um, friendships, uh, near-death experiences, uh, people's houses, general elections, the same sort of subjects that mass observation were interested in studying, but now with a more contemporary feel. Um, our current directive, which observers all over the country are, are writing to, is on serial killers, the countryside, and happiness, what makes you happy. So it's a really eclectic mix that we get to write about. Um, the themes themselves are suggested by academics. Sometimes academics will have um, a pot of funding that they'll buy into the project with us, but also archive staff. Um, if we think that there's a particular important event that we need to record, then we'll run that. But also the observers themselves will suggest directives. Um, in general, I'd say themes and the questions are quite broad. Um, they're really reflective and they encourage a kind of detailed, personal um, approach. We like observers to tell stories and we think that they like telling them too. Um, and they often reflect on their kind of experiences of everyday life. I'm going to get Fiona to read one from a recent directive on hairdressing. 
<laughs> oh, this is so true. Um, I think my hair reflects my personality fairly well, casual and a bit chaotic. But I do get to the stage where I really want to have it cut because it annoys me. My mother always said make the most of your hair while you're young because after the age of 30 you'll have to have it cut short or wear it up. Obviously long hair and impending middle age didn't go together. I've never worn my hair up in a ponytail, it hurts too much. I don't judge other people by their hairstyles. I might notice if they've had it done and it looks good. There used to be a stigma attached to having hair dyed, but now anything goes, even for men. Actually, perhaps I'm a bit judgmental about colour. I tend to think that if people dye their hair some totally unnatural colour, then they're making a look at me statement. Having said that, my stepson's girlfriend had scarlet hair, or sometimes blue, but she's really quite a mouse. Perhaps it's compensatory. My stepson is naturally dark brown haired, but is currently bleached blonde. Looks rather odd because his stubble and sideburns are still dark. However, my other stepson dyed his hair and said that blondes have much more fun. It's made me feel quite worried now because since I reached 30, I've been growing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely impending middle age. <laughs> okay, so since um, 1981, nearly 3,500 people have contributed to the project. They haven't t- all taken part at once. Instead, the panel size has varied over the years. In the, in the late 80s, we had around 1,000 people writing for us, so there's a lot of envelope stuffing to do. I'm quite pleased now that we have email. Um, but we um, now keep the panel size at around um, 500, and our current panel size is 495 pe- uh, people. Um, they've all been writing for varying lengths of time. Some people have been writing um, for over 30 years. I think we've got about 15 people who've been writing since 1981. So if someone could follow their kind of life story and see how different, how they've responded differently over the years. Other people have been writing for a couple of years and some just a couple of months. Some like to do it just for a couple of months and then drop it again. Okay. So let's think now about how they've been recruited. Um, we don't do any direct advertising, which you might know because sometimes people say, oh, I've never heard of Mass Observation and I didn't know that you were still having writers. But instead, um, we let people come to us. In the very first couple of years of the project, the the directors did um, put some uh, adverts in newspapers, there was newspapers in the Daily Mirror, the Guardian and that kind of thing. But since then, we've just kind of relied on um, when we're mentioned in the press or when there's a TV programme or a radio programme, and social media, we've got quite a big presence on Twitter, and people find us that way. Younger stu- uh, people tend to find us through their study, um, and university lecturers, and that kind of thing. Um, but we do, despite not doing any advertising, we still receive about 250 applications a year to join the project. And we can't accept them all. So because of that, we have a recruitment criteria, this is uh, male writers who are aged 16 to 44, living in all regions of the UK except for the South East. So this always disappoints people when, when you're in Brighton, but we do accept people who meet two of the criteria. So we would accept a man from Brighton who is between 16 and 44. Yes, that's right. Um, but I'll explain why we have this, uh, sort of this recruitment criteria. It's because we have so many older women who want to write. So we look now a bit at the kind of profile of our writers. Um, 41% of our writers are currently ma- are, are male, while 59% of them are female. This is the age profile. Um, most of our writers are sort of in between 27 and 50, with uh, 60 with 26% for each of the, the two middle categories there. But this um, demographic here, this uh, six, 61 to 70, which is 11%, they're the ones who are really committed at writing and responding. So their writing is really represented in the archive. And you know, it's because they're most likely retired and got quite a lot of time on their hands and they don't have, the, well, seemingly to me, they don't have the same pressures sort of kind of going to work and that kind of thing. This is the location of our writers. Um, it's fairly evenly spread across the United Kingdom. Um, 
but we do have less of our writers coming from Scotland and, and Wales. Um, top cities are over here, so there's quite a few writers in London and also quite a few writers in Brighton, again, I suppose we're quite popular here. So if you are out and about in Brighton and you see someone writing in a notebook, more something could be an observer. They could be noting down how long it takes you to drink your pint <laughs> on a private <laughs> night. Um, we don't really collect data about our, our, our writer's occupation, and this is because people change jobs quite a lot, so it's quite hard to kind of capture and keep or on top of it. But this is some of our, some, a word cloud of the data that we have in our, in our catalogues. So popular jobs are housewife, teacher, librarian. Um, we also have people who are photographers, cleaners, uh, factory workers, bankers, um, people who work in the media, artists, artists. There's a real kind of varied jobs in the project. Um, given that people have real complex complexities in their everyday life, we're kind of always continually amazed that they do find the time to respond to directives. I don't know how you feel, but I often think if someone was asking me about my home life or about um, asking me to keep a diary for a day or, or anything that I might, it might become near the bottom of my pile of things to do. Maybe that's just me, maybe you're much better than me. But, um, so we're always really surprised that they do take the time to write and do um, respond to the directives. But we have asked them why they write and here's some um, quotes about their motivation. And also, quite often people will ask us whether mass participation is still relevant in this day and age when people are doing things like responding, uh, writing blogs or recording their lives on Facebook or Twitter or that kind of thing. So what we found is that because mass, mass observers are able to write um, anonymously, all our observers get given a code. You can see these codes here, H1541 that this maybe gives them a bit more freedom to write a bit more truthfully or, or without feeling like they're being watched by Facebook or those kinds of things. Um, so uh, one of our writers says, writing for MO feels more worthwhile than any other social research, mostly because it is relatively unrestricted and much closer to something than a tick box. Another, another one says, a chance to write to feel part of something bigger than me and my life a slight immortality. So again there's that nice thing about sending something to to an archive to a place like this even knowing that it's going to be kept forever. Um, this this point about freedom to write is quite interesting because what we found often is that, that lots of our observers maybe go against the kind of the grain that you might expect for them to to uh, the opinions that they might expect, you might expect them to have. So, for instance, um, things like royal events. So, if you can read the quotes from this is um, from spring 2005 in response to a question about the wedding of Charles and Camilla. Well, good luck to them. I hope postponed wedding goes well. That they have a good life together. So they're not very exciting. Does it matter? After the erotic Diana, who did the royal family no favours apart from producing William, who miraculously seems to have a sensible head on his shoulders, a bit of normality makes a pleasant change. They have known each other for such a long time, and it's a pity that Charles didn't assert himself when they first met. They seem contented with each other, and I hope they'll be happy now. And yes, I do think that all the fuss is generated by the media, who have created most of the hype and criticism aimed at the royal family in modern times. Give them a break, they aren't that bad. So Charles is out of touch with the way the majority lead our lives. Is this so surprising, given, that, given his upbringing? There is only so much he can do about this, for he is a victim of his position and can hardly stop being Prince Charles. Everywhere he goes, the places are primped and polished so that he only sees the best of everything. No one is going to show him a dirty hospital ward or graffiti-covered housing estates, so of course it's hard for him to judge. If Tony Blair could be so out of touch with life after eight years as Prime Minister, Charles and the rest of the family have no chance. 
There's something quite nice about that because at the time there was lots of press reports that people didn't want Charles and Camilla to get married and that they were actually really bothered, whereas in my situation you can kind of find this counter, counter narrative to that. I'm going to end here just to talk a little bit about our 12th of May diary project. You know that I was saying that our observers now are, are, have this recruitment criteria, but this is a project that we launched um, four years ago now for everyone to contribute to. Um, on, the 12th, on the 12th of May, if you um, write a diary, you can send it to the archive and it will be kept here with, along um, with all our collections. Um, uh, the 12th of May is a very important day for my participation, as Fiona said. It's, it was kind of the launch day for my participation, the day of, of the new coronation. And when we launched um, again in 2010, it was actually the day of the new coalition government. So we didn't actually plan that it was going to be that day, it just ended up being the coalition day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Extract. Yeah, this is an extract from the 12th of May 2010 from Diary and stuff. I think at that point we were asking people to keep it to 500 words, yeah. so it's quite a snappy one. Why and I returned from a two-week holiday on the 11th, driving back through traffic jams from London to Leicester in the evening, listening, li listening live to Gordon's resignation and Dave's assumption of power. Woke up at six, two hours earlier than usual, it is holiday time, and went through the morning in spaced out zombie mode, feeling terribly cold after 30 degree heat. Went to newsagent for Guardian, have recently stopped getting it delivered. I like the pre-breakfast walk and scanning the other front pages. Confused thoughts about whether Clegg had done the right thing. Parliamentary arithmetic and Labour tribalism. We had seen Job Reid on BBC World Service on Monday night polemicising against a coalition of the losers. Seemed to rule out the Lab Lib coalition I had voted for by proxy. Better to put in a minority Tory government, leaning all to, leaving all to play for in a second election, than in effect to lend Liberal to cover to Tory cuts. Don't usually spend breakfast puzzling about politics, but these are expect exceptional times, not at all the quite ordinary day that MO had anticipated. So, if you can find the time and stuff and make send us a diary, then please, please do. Thank you very much. That's all we have to say. If anybody's got any questions or queries or feel free to ask. <laughs> anybody got any questions? Um, do you have records in the archive you know about the project initiation right at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. We've got um, some, uh, obviously, because they probably never thought it was going to be still going all of these years later. We have the remains of a lot of correspondence between the founders, particularly, um, some of which is hilarious because they think we'll get on, and then you suddenly realise that it is, you know, merciful that anything ever got kept. But uh, so we have the story uh, between the founders, but also we have some of the instructions that were sent out to observers as well. So they didn't uh, they didn't archive themselves, but we've just managed to sort of piece together through also individuals giving us their archives or remains of archives that we've been able to piece together that organisational history. Mm. Was there any early connect, contact with Cecil Sharp House? No. Was it no. 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 I mean, there have been sort of Precedents, which interesting, I've never ever seen mass observa in mass observation in that correspondence I was talking about. I've never ever seen them refer to it. But things like the New London Survey, which took place in the early 30s, um, which was very very similar to mass observation, but mm. kind of just focused on London. Um, and indeed, of course, things like the Charles Booth Survey of London as well, back in the previous century, this kind of idea of going out there and watching what's going on around. But mass observation was very good at claiming it was the first to everything. I think that was probably the nature of uh, Tom Harrison mm. being very ambitious now. Young yeah. men's egos. Why was Bolton chosen? Was it a connection with Harrison? Well, the, yeah, I think there might have been money involved in that. He, uh, was, I think, was sponsored because Mass Observation was an independent organisation. It worked with government, with the Ministry of Information, for about four months at the beginning of the war, and they fell out big time. Again, I think the egos all clashed. But in order to survive, they w relied on sponsorship or publications and things like that. And that very first project, I 
think is sponsored by um, Leeds Yeah, you, so it's Leeds and, and they have factories up there. So I think that's part of the reason he went. But also, um, had this thing about uh, watching a, a place that was very alien to him. And Bolton was alien to him because it was working class and it was northern. It is quite extraordinary how alien it was <laughs> to them. We've got some correspondence from um, Graham Bell, who was there for two, for just two weeks, and the way he writes about it, it's like he's gone to war and he's in the trenches. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> he was an artist who was quite kind of linked in down, down south, um, but a very sort of uh, art school. And <coughs> But they, they're very funny, a lot of the letters we have from that time. But they're also very young men. Mm. They're all men, but very young men that were going there, sort of often pre university, being plain grown ups. <laughs> if you have a quick list of gaps here. What format do you keep in the response? Um, we, we keep them all electronically, but we still print them out <laughs> and put them in our box because we haven't quite worked out it, how we want people to access them really mm. in that kind of way. But maybe in the future, maybe there will be a kind of terminal or something yeah. in the reference room. We work. So that's why I'm walking to the printer so often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are working on um, on a, a digital preservation kind of operational plan to be able to, to to deal with it. But I think it'll be a long time before we stop printing them out. Actually. Mm. Mm. So if we want to see the actual early documents, yeah. are they the things that are here? We have to make. An appointment to see, or are they? They're, they're here. Um, you can book to view them in our yeah, reading rooms, yeah. but there's also a proportion that have been digitised, which you can access through something called Master of Space Online. And other organisations have Master of Space Online, like the British Library, and the university. You know, university. So if you want to look at the real material, it's here. You to book to see specific things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't just. I mean, I, I no. had. Thought of it just being an interesting place to wander around and see different things that you might not. Yeah, we could thought. we could give you lists of things that are in the collection and then maybe you can have a browse that way. But yeah, you have to actually order some mm -hmm. documents. Sometimes just looking through the different themes mm -hmm. that they covered, um, which we got in hard copy, is really interesting mm -hmm. in itself. And then being able to say, well, actually, I would be really interested in dogs in wartime. And having a look through that. Do you think if there the people that volunteer to write, there's obviously a certain type of person that volunteers mm. to write, do you think that creates any kind of bias? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but um, I think it's with any volunteer project that that will happen. Yeah. Um, but often, I mean, but the way to approach it, of sociologists seem to struggle sometimes. Well, well, this isn't representative of British life, so how can you <coughs> extrapolate information from it? Well, actually, you, people don't say that about oral histories, where you only have to make 12 oral histories, but they're able to sort of create a history from that. So um, if you think about the three or 400 responses we might have to a theme being case studies, then it's not such an issue, mm -hmm. the fact that they're, they're volunteers. And lots of people who use um, the Mass Observation Project will use something else in conjunction with it, so they might do another project alongside it to try and diversify the, the material that they're getting. Yeah. And then use and this as telling stories. Mm -hmm. I would say the advantage of that on over oral history is that it's written at the time. Yeah. yeah. Whereas oral history depends on your memory. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. has yeah. Yeah. Very true. And that's one of our um, collecting our acquisition criteria is that we do not collect collect memoir or retrospective writing. Um, they all get sent off to the Great Diary, put no, the um, Imperial War Museum. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, prior to the archive, we set up the Archive of Scotland, and we did people keep kept working in individual offices. It was in MO's offices in London, in their basement, um, most of it not, not kept in very good conditions, <laughs> and then it came to Sussex to be sorted, but other bits of the collection have found their way to us because they might be in people's private collections and those kind of things, but mostly it was in their head offices. So I'm just wondering if you feel like it's the kind of complete archive of the project, or do you think bits and pieces have gotten to be no longer? I think I think I think it's pretty
pretty complete, yeah. but I think a lot has gone missing. And when we, we don't have diaries from 1941, yeah. because year, they've gone, and of course there was a war on. <laughs> so we don't know how much stuff got lost or destroyed, or um, but, but... But mostly I think you can piece it to, yeah. together. I, d I don't really ever feel like we're going, oh, there's a big gap here, yeah. apart from that diary year. Yeah. But it's certainly not, I don't think it was ever systematically kept or catalogued in that way until the 1970s. And um, quite often you'll, for example, some of these books, you'll read through it and you'll think, oh, that's really interesting, where do they get that data from? And you try and find the raw data, and there's no sign of it. So I know bits have mm. disappeared. Sometimes I wonder how, how good they were, though, that they might have made that things up. Sometimes in, in the books, when you're counting the percentage, you're there saying this is 10% of people did this, and 90% of people did this, and another 20% of people did this. Yeah. Hang on, that's handy with 20%. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Questions? Do other countries do this? Do, do you sort of liaise with other countries just to get ideas from them? Um, not really that we know of, although um, last year in Korea they, they ran the Clough May project. Oh, right. So, um, but no, we don't know. Them not in, in terms of the length of time it's been going on for. Mm -hmm. So, Mass Observation has inspired various other projects mm -hmm. over the years in different countries Italy, Sweden, I think Australia have run one as well. They t and, and Dublin, somebody did a, an observation of Dublin a couple of years ago. Um, but they tend to be short term projects. So nothing that's got the same longitudinal mm -hmm. potential that this has. Um, but yeah, we certainly look for partners around. I think that the 12th of May is a really good focus for doing that sort of thing around the world to try and sort of mm -hmm. create something. Mm -hmm. and it's worked really nicely in South Korea, but other countries. Oh, we're doing it with China this year mm -hmm. as well. The mm -hmm. Women's University in China. So. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, just to advertise, the next In Focus talk will be in a month's time. Chris Fortet will be talking about the treasures of um, East Sussex Record Office. So look forward to seeing you then.